Oh man, greetings all. Greetings, greetings. I see a handful of you on here. If you can hear me talking, please share the stream. Help us get more eyes on this show. If my lips are moving, you won't be able to hear this, but if my lips are moving <laughs> and you can't hear me, then report any technical issues in the comments. Please let us know if you have any issues hearing or seeing the program so we can address those issues and make sure you can watch the whole show with no problem. Um, my name is Leia Sanu. This is Weekly Pan-African News presented by All African Peoples Revolutionary Party in New Mexico. I am a cadre with APIP New Mexico. We are just one chapter of a revolutionary Pan-African socialist organization based in Africa, founded in Africa, the All African Peoples Revolutionary Party. And our political objective is Pan-Africanism, which we define as one unified socialist Africa. We're gonna get into why socialist Africa on the show today. And also, I just have to be transparent. <laughs> I am like feeling very under the weather. And so I apologize if I'm like lower energy than I usually am. Maybe it'll be good because sometimes I get too lit um, on the show. But yeah, I'm not like I'm not like COVID sick. I'm like you're 34 years old and you can't eat any kind of random thing sick. <laughs> so it's like my own fault. <laughs> but yeah, I feel rough. But we're gonna keep it going. We have a very good show for y'all today. A well researched political education section, as well as some updates about what's happening in this pandemic. The United States is obviously the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're going to talk about the implications of that for African people. It's going to be great. So once again, my name is Onisanu. I am a cadre with the New Mexico chapter of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, the AAPRP. The APIP is a revolutionary pan-African socialist party based in Africa, founded in Africa, 52 years ago this year by one Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah was the first democratically elected president of the first nation in Africa to gain independence from European colonialism. That nation was Ghana. And then after Ghana gained its independence, Kwame Nkrumah said on its first Independence Day, the independence of Ghana is meaningless without the total liberation of Africa. And what we meant by that is one free African nation could not hope to survive, could not hope to stay free if the entirety of the continent around it was conquered, was colonized. And so Kwame Nkrumah correctly understood that all of Africa must be free, unified, and socialist in order for African liberation to be realized, not just for the continent, but for Africans all around the world. So that's who we are. We started this show, Weekly Pan-African News, back in March at the beginning of the pandemic. We have very frequently done community events, political education events in person here in Tiwa territory, but when the pandemic started and we saw that it was gonna be African people that were among the most impacted, we were like, we cannot in good conscience bring our folks together in person, so let's figure out how we can continue to reach them. And this show is just one of the many, many ways that New Mexico chapter has found to continue our political education work. So we always do two things at the beginning of every show. The first thing we always do is call in an ancestor essentially dedicating the show to an ancestor, bringing that ancestor in the space to guide our work. And the ancestor I want to bring in today is one Kwame Ture. Kwame Ture. You may also know him by his slave name, Stokely Carmichael. Greetings, Lay Jammer of Black Hammer Lambat. You may also know him as a former organizer with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, one of the African organizations that was instrumental in organizing our people for the right to vote. You may know him from his brief time in the Black Panthers, but I know him and love him for his work to build the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Kwame Ture was a dedicated organizer of the masses of African people for liberation. He was one of the people that popularized the term Black Power. Mukasa Ricks coined the term, and Kwame Ture popularized it among the masses of our people during the March Against Fear in Mississippi in the 1960s. And after he joined SNCC, he developed a revolutionary internationalist analysis that radicalized that organization, and he brought that analysis into the APRP, where he dedicated his life to the struggle to liberate Africa and to build Pan-Africanism. So this coming Sunday the 15th 
is the anniversary of Kwame Ture's transition from this earth, and members of the All African People's Revolutionary Party have been spending the past month honoring his legacy, talking about what he meant to us, talking about what we still have to learn from ancestor Kwame Ture. Like, there are so many things that Kwame Ture speaks on when it comes to, like, the African petty bourgeois, when it comes to the primacy, primacy of Africa, when it comes to how irrelevant the Democratic Party is for African liberation. There are so many things that Kwame Ture has spoken on that you can find on YouTube that are still relevant in 2020. He would have said them in like the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and they're still relevant because not only have the contradictions that he was analyzing not changed, but in many cases they've become worse. And so I definitely recommend people looking up, like search YouTube for Kwame Ture. I'm gonna put how you spell his name in the chat. Search YouTube for this man and you will find hours and hours of speeches uploaded by dedicated African revolutionaries who were like, this these, this person's words cannot be lost to time. We must continue to learn from him. So look him up on YouTube, watch his speeches. One I really recommend is actually on the APRP New Mexico channel, um, Lessons from the 60s, and learn from this man. Learn from this man who was instrumental in so many different phases of the African liberation struggle. He was there during the so-called civil rights movement. He was on the front line organizing African people for the right to vote when the Klan was trying to blow them up for it. He was on the front line organizing independent African political parties. Because when SNCC was organizing African people for the right to vote, they were not registering those people to vote for the Democratic Party. They were trying to build independent African organizations. That's why, man, it's a tangent, Never mind. Because sometimes people say our ancestors died for the right to vote, and they use that as a rationalization for voting for Democrats. And I'm like, you do not know the actual history of how that happened. You do not know that our people were trying to build independent political parties. And that is why you're trying to tell me that voting for Democrats is going to advance my liberation, because you're confused. But anyway, look out commentary on YouTube. Learn from this man. Learn about this man. And also check out the articles on the ancestor section of the APRP International website, APRP-INTL.org for a very, very beautiful tribute to Kwame Ture. That was a little longer than I hoped because I feel like I can't talk about voting without getting really irritated <laughs> and going into a tangent. So I apologize. And then the other thing that we always do at the beginning of the show is that we want to do a land acknowledgement. I am speaking to y'all from occupied Tiwa territory, also known as the city of Albuquerque, New Mexico, that Tiwa Pueblo are the rightful owners of this land point blank period. It is their land, it will always be their land, and it will be their land again. The entirety of the United States, in fact, the entirety of the nations of the Western Hemisphere were built on stolen indigenous land. Just like European colonizers went to Africa and stole our land, they came here and they stole indigenous land. They went to Palestine, they stole indigenous land. They went to Australia and they stole indigenous land. And so when we do Atlantic judgment, it's not to say, uh, we acknowledge this is your land and then we're just going to keep it. It's to say land back, not a metaphor. When we say land back, we mean land was taken and land will be returned as part of the process of decolonization, as part of the process to destroy capitalism, as part of the process to destroy imperialism. Land back from Africa to Palestine to Turtle Island, point blank period, not a metaphor. This is Tiwa land and it always will be. I see y'all, uh, in the comments, <laughs> so let me just read what you're saying. Greetings, Prudence. Kwame Ture, our, our Prudence on Kwame Ture, saying such an amazing teacher. I could listen to him all day. He is so intelligent yet so clear. Like that is, yes, correct. Absolutely one thing about Kwame Ture that I really appreciate is that he is a clear speaker who uses plain language and humor to convey revolutionary pan-African political ideas. Like he's not speaking an academic lingo. He's not speaking like from above looking down on us. He's speaking like he's of us. And so it's very, very easy to understand why pan-Africanism, why socialism, why we're anti-Zionist, why the United States is not for us. Like he puts it in such plain language. He is like ruthless about pointing out the contradictions so clearly and so plainly in such an easy to listen to way. That's why I highly, highly recommend that you watch some of these man's speeches so you can see exactly what we're talking about. And then Matt says, couldn't agree more about the continued relevance of Kwame Ture's thinking, speeches, etc. He has taught me so much. Thank you for continuing to honor his life. Thank you, comrade Matt. Absolutely agree. Like one thing I've actually noticed um, in like the past year or so 
is that like small clips of Kwame Ture speaking keep going viral. Like on Twitter, people will retweet them hundreds of times, sometimes thousands of times. Just like a 30 second clip or a minute long clip of Kwame Ture. And very often the people who are like, who are like vibing with what he's saying have no idea about the APRP, are not revolutionary pan Africanists, are not socialists. They're just like hearing this man speak and being like, damn, that makes sense. And it's like resonating. It keeps happening and it makes me really excited because it shows the continuing relevance of this man's analysis, the continuing relevance of revolutionary pan Africanism as the strategy to liberate African people. So yeah, I peep that like on Twitter, people keep retweeting Kwame Ture. I don't even know who he is. They're just like, man, this makes sense. It's like really cool. It's really cool. He's like still here with us. And that's why we called him in today. So every single episode of the show, we do a segment on political education. You are never gonna come to an all African people's Revolutionary Party event without that event having a component of political education. Because like Malcolm X says, and which I always say, you cannot organize a sleeping people. You must wake them up and that's how you get action. Political education is how we wake up the masses of our people. The capitalist system, the colonial system, the imperialist system works really, really, really hard to put our people to sleep, to confuse them about the fundamental nature of our oppression. Political education wakes them up, exposes the contradictions, exposes why we are oppressed, and also exposes how we can move collectively to transform those conditions. So every single APRP event, internally or externally, always has this component of political education. We are trying to wake up our people. We are trying to show them we do not have to accept the way this capitalist system has set things up, that we can tear it down and build something so much better in its place. And today, the PE topic for the show is what that better system can be, or what is socialism? So I mentioned at the beginning of the show, APIP is the Revolutionary Pan-African Socialist Party. We are a revolutionary Pan-African Socialist Party. And when we say Pan-African, Pan -African, we are talking about a political objective, that political objective being one unified socialist Africa. But why socialism? If you live in the Western world, particularly if you live in the snakes, I guarantee you that you have heard and internalized just like a lot of utter nonsense about socialism. Like nothing but like just hot mess, like hot bullshit, just lies on every level about socialism to the point where I'm sure like a not insignificant number of people when I said socialism like flinched or were like, no, <laughs> like, like automatically because that's what always happens when you talk about it among people who identify as Americans. They're like immediately like resistant, even though if you ask them directly, they could not define it like the majority of the time. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not funny because it's not your fault. It's not your fault, right? Because you you're confused. But it is a little funny because you don't know what it is, but you're actually you're super against it. Anyway, so what actually is it? First and foremost, to understand socialism, to understand capitalism, to understand any economic system, communism, anything, you first must understand what the means of production are. The means of production. Maybe you've heard that term before from a communist on the internet. I'm gonna break it down precisely what it is. First, let me block this person that is spamming the feed. Okay, so the means of production. It's very important to understand that no matter what economic system is in place, whether it be capitalism, communism, socialism, or anything else, is organized around the means of production. And the means of production, to put it simply, are just how goods and services are produced within a given society. The means of production are how goods and services are produced within a given society. I'm putting this in plain English, not commie speak. So when we think about production, how goods and services are produced, we're thinking about things like electricity, we're thinking about water supplies, we're thinking about the production of oil and energy for heating, we're thinking about the production that produces cars, computers, cell phones, basically all the things that you could use and buy within a given economic system are produced by the means of production. And so when we talk about capitalism versus socialism, or capitalism versus communism, or any economic system, we are talking about who controls those means of production? Who controls the means by which goods and services that everybody needs are produced within a given society? Under capitalism, a handful of people control the means of production. 
a handful of people, you may call them the 1%, you may call them the ruling class, you may call them the bourgeois, but that very small number of people relative to the rest of the population on earth control the means of production and use that means of production to generate wealth and capital for themselves. That is capitalism. Capitalism is private ownership of the means of production by a handful of people. In the current paradigm, the current reality, that handful of people is like mostly Europeans, but by no means not all Europeans, and increasingly not all Europeans. They're mostly dudes, but by all means not even like, yeah, not all dudes. There was like, you know, there's a belief among some sectors of the left that the ruling class is like only Europeans. But today I read an article about a Nigerian billionaire who owns several mining companies who is gonna loot platinum from the Congo and loot gold from Ghana and loot uh, bauxite from Zania. And I was like, damn son, <laughs> like if, the, if all the ruling class is European, then what the hell is going on here? Anyway, so capitalism is a system in which the means of production are controlled by a very small number of people for the generation of wealth for that group of people while everybody else just like works and works and works and works and has to sell their labor to survive and gets nothing, <laughs> nothing in return, just gets their labor exploited and the value they produce stolen by this ruling class, by the bourgeois. Socialism, on the other hand, is an economic system where that means of production is controlled by all of us collectively. So instead of like a very small number of people controlling the means of production and the resources in a given society for their own personal benefit, socialism is a system where all of the members of society, poor working class people, collectively control that means of production for the collective benefit. Instead of a few people getting really, really, really just like ridiculously rich, like having more money than they'll ever be able to spend in their entire lives, instead the wealth produced by the society the goods and services produced by the society are democratically and controlled and equitably distributed so that every single person in that society has everything they need to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. Not just like survive, to be honest with you, but to thrive. So capitalism is a system in which a handful of people control the means of production for their personal benefit. Socialism is a system where all of us control the means of production, as we should. Like we do the labor on a day-to-day -day basis that makes those means of production produce anything in the first place. So it makes no sense that a tiny handful of people should control all the wealth that we produce while the rest of us can't even get healthcare during a global pandemic. It makes no sense whatsoever. And that's the difference between capitalism and socialism. Capitalism is a system where a few people win, socialism is a system where we all win. So that's the means of production. That's capitalism versus socialism. If anything I'm saying doesn't make sense, if you want more clarity about a particular thing, Drop it in the comments. If you want to fight about how capitalism is better, I cannot help you. So, socialism is a system where the masses of people, the masses of poor and working class and colonized people own and control the means of production. And what can they do when they own and control the means of production? Well, they can use the resources and wealth produced by that means of production to meet the basic needs of everybody in a particular society. So again, instead of a small number of people being really wealthy and being able to travel on private spaceships to Mars, instead, we can use the wealth that we produce using the means of production to plan an economy where production, instead of being organized to produce wealth, is instead organized to make sure everybody has housing, like in Venezuela, to make sure everybody has healthcare, like in Cuba, Cuba has been blockaded by the United States for 60 years. Cuba has been choked. They have, the United States has attempted to strangle the Cuban economy. Cuba has to scrimp and save and like come up with all kinds of solutions that they should not have to because of this blockade. And despite that fact, every single person in Cuba has access to quality healthcare. And as soon as COVID hit, Cuba was able to organize community medical support from the most rural area to the most dense city and make sure that this virus did not wreak havoc upon an already poor population. That is that because Cuba is socialist and Cuba has organized its means of production in such a way that healthcare, high quality healthcare and doctors can be provided to the entire population. 
That is the difference between means of production that are uh, collectively controlled for the benefit of all of us and means of production that are privately controlled for the benefit of a handful of really rich people. So yeah, when the means of production are collectively controlled, when the economy is planned and the wealth produced within that economy is organized to meet the needs of a given society, you are able to see a situation in which people do not have to struggle and scrap to survive. Instead, housing, healthcare, education, uh, employment is just provided to everybody because that is how the economy is organized for life instead of for profit. So that is like the promise of socialism. And for African people who exist at the bottom of every capitalist society on earth or near the bottom, because I don't want to play oppression Olympics, African people find ourselves in a situation where we come from objectively the richest landmass on the face of the planet. We were stolen from the richest, most resource rich landmass on the face of the planet. But because capitalism steals the resources of our home to enrich a handful of people, we are in a situation where we are the poorest people across the board, where we do not have consistent, consistent access to education, not even consistent access to healthcare or safe housing or safe community. No matter where we exist, we do not have the resources we need to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. We're seeing exactly the consequences of that during this pandemic, where African people alongside indigenous and uh, Chicano people and Filipino people are being rocked, are being wrecked by COVID-19 because we don't have access to basic healthcare on any level. So we're forced to go to work, we're forced to sell our labor to survive, and in exchange, we get no healthcare, not even the promise of healthcare, because in a capitalist society, the motivation of the organization of society is not about making sure everybody's good. It's about making sure that a handful of people get more money and stay rich. So that is socialism. That is why Pan-Africanism is a socialist political objective, one unified socialist Africa. Because even if we were able to throw out all the foreign invaders from Africa, even if we were able to like wrest control of it you know, from Europe and from the United States and from the Zionists, even if we're able to accomplish that, if capitalism is still the system that dominates the African continent, all we will see is a new generation of African bourgeois and petty bourgeois stepping in immediately to continue the exploitation of the masses of African people, not just on the continent, but throughout the diaspora. If we allow an economic system where a handful of people can control the wealth while the rest of us suffer, that handful of people is gonna make sure we stay on the bottom. We must not just liberate Africa from foreign domination, but build a better system that does not allow anybody, any small handful of people to exert their will upon the rest of us. Socialism is that system. Socialism is how we definitively liberate Africa once and for all from the capitalist imperialist system, from this small group of really rich people who would see us all suffer and die rather than give up even a fraction of what they have. What are y'all saying? Monique is saying socialism equals we all win equals collectivism. Precisely. Another way to understand the difference between socialism and capitalism is to understand the difference between collectivism and individualism. Capitalism says that the individual advancement of one African above all other Africans somehow represents a victory for all of us. If, if Jay-Z becomes a millionaire, somehow me as a working class African woman should be pleased by that. Not because Jay-Z is gonna cut me a check. Not because Jay-Z intends to use that wealth to advance the masses of his people, but only because I should see the symbolism of an African exploiting other people within capitalism and think that means something for me. Socialism says, fuck Jay-Z. Not like, you know, I'm saying that, but like socialism says, it doesn't matter if one individual African person has a lot of money, if the masses of African people are still poor. It makes no difference whatsoever. Socialism says we have not want all one until we have all one. Socialism says all of us for each other rather than every man for himself. So for reasons that are hopefully obvious at this point, the AAPRP defines our political objective as Pan-Africanism as one unified socialist Africa because we don't want an African ruling class stepping in the place of the foreign ruling class to exploit Africa. We want no ruling class 
exploiting Africa. We want the wealth and land and resources and labor of Africa and Africans collectively controlled by us, the masses of African people, and no one else. No one else. No oppressors of any color. So, um, so Lay Jam is asking, why should people of African descent and the diaspora unite with socialism? Because if Africa is unified, socialist, and free, if the resources of Africa are democratically and collectively controlled by the masses of African people, then Af the African nation as a whole, which includes the diaspora, will have the material resources and political power required to make sure that every single African person, no matter where they exist in the world, is gonna be good. Like I said at the beginning of the show, Africa is the most resource rich and wealthiest landmass on the face of the planet. And additionally, Africa has the youngest and fastest growing labor force on the entire planet. People call African people minorities, but truth be told, we are the fastest growing demographic on earth. On earth. And so when the resources and wealth and labor of Africa are collectively controlled, by the masses of African people, it means we can use that wealth to make sure that every single person of African descent, no matter where they live in the world, has healthcare, has housing, has education, has a safe community to live in, has real political power. One unified socialist Africa liberates Africans all over the world. We steal cap, we don't steal it, we're taking Africa back from capitalism and using its resources collectively for the advancement of the African nation. Point blank period. You are not gonna get anything close to a future like that from capitalism or from the US empire or from Europe or from wherever you're coming from. You're just not gonna get that kind of future. The best possible future, the best possible opportunity for self-determination for people of African descent in the continent and in the diaspora is the liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. That is our land, that is our home, we must liberate it from capitalism and imperialism, and we must make sure that its wealth is democratically controlled by the masses of African people. Africa is ours. This hemisphere is not ours. The United States is not ours. This is not ours. We don't need to like cling to that. We must turn towards Africa, and we must fight to liberate Africa, not just from foreign domination, but from all forms of domination under capitalism. And the only way to do that is by building one unified socialist Africa, period. Let me see. So Prudence saying, I read on Twitter, I don't judge the progress of black folks by how well black elites are doing, and that is the damn truth. 1,000 1, Jay-Zs don't mean shit for the masses. The focus should be the masses. Period. Point. Blank. Period. Point. Blank. Oh my God. It has been like so infuriating watching the rise of this petty bourgeois class of African misleaders. All these like aging um, hip hop stars talking about I'm the new Malcolm X, where the Black Panthers, man, I was listening to a Little Kim song and I lick Little Kim, but Little Kim is not a revolutionary. She's not a radical. I listened to the jump off and she was like, she compared her and like whatever group she was with that produced the song to the Black Panthers. And I was like, what the fuck? Like these people are lost in the sauce. These like petty bourgeois African like media personalities who are trying to position themselves as political leaders, like they are confused sellouts, man. And they take up so much political space in the movement to build Pan-Africanism. They have all this wealth that was only possible because of the struggles of the masses of African people. And they do nothing, nothing between, beyond like petty charity to advance the masses of their people. They just like hoard wealth and vacation in the Hamptons and, wear, and throw parties where everybody wears all white and all this kind of like hot bullshit. And we're supposed to be like, yes, lead us to free. Oh my God. Like, it's so irritating to me. It's so irritating. It's so irritating. Whenever someone's like, you know, African based in a high place, uh, we all won. Like, Kamala Harris is vice president. I should be happy as an African woman. I just get so mad because you, there's not, we get nothing for that. We get nothing for putting them in those positions. They get up there and then they just figure out how to sell us out while pretending like they're helping us. That's the, like, that's the consistent move. I miss the times, like, in the 60s and the 70s, where if an African celebrity was, like, engaged in the movement, they were, like, in support of African liberation, all they did was, like, give money and, like, bail people out of jail and be quiet. Just, just be quiet. They weren't trying to lead. They were just providing material support and, like, signal boosting. Now, 2020, they're trying to lead, and they don't even read books. 
It's terrible. It's terrible. Anyway, gas chamber, blah, 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 blah. Socialism, communism, and democratic capitalism are all Eurocentric ideology that organize society for means of production, commodify nature, and native people do not commodify nature for self gain. I like that. Because that actually leads me to the next thing I want to talk about, which is the question of is socialism. Excuse me. I have to drink some water. I said I was sick. I was going to try to like um, tone it down, but then I got lit anyway. And I still feel like crap, man. So the question of is socialism a white or Eurocentric ideology? This is a very, very common critique of um, people who have internalized a particular narrative about what socialism is. And the answer I have to that question of is socialism white ideology is no, it's not. Just like point blank. It's not Eurocentric. It's not white. Karl Marx is very often um, attributed as like the originator of socialist or communist ideology, as kind of like the inventor of socialist communist ideology. And to that, I would kick to y'all a Kwame Ture quote, because once again, Kwame Ture is extremely good at breaking things down in a way that is very clear and very easy to understand. And so Kwame Ture has like a little spiel, right? Where he talks about how Newton so-called discovered gravity. The way that we learn Newton discovered gravity is that he was like sitting under a tree and an apple fell from the tree and it hit him on the head. And so for that reason, Isaac Newton was like, oh, well, I wonder why that happened. And he like wrote down his theory of what gravity was, right? But gravity existed as like a real thing, like a material force within the universe before that European man noticed it existed. Like, Sir Isaac Newton was not the discoverer of gravity. I guarantee you, before Sir Isaac Newton was like, damn, this apple fell from the tree, there must be a force pulling it down. Before he wrote that down, for hundreds or thousands of years, there were people that noticed precisely that. The only reason he got credit for being just the discoverer of this force that has always existed is because he was the first European man to write it down. And it's very, very similar with Marx. We do not, by any means, intend to downplay the contribution of Marx to the development of socialist ideology, but it's just like absolute fact that that man just observed what was happening in society. All he did was observe how capitalism was, was working and write that shit down. And then he was, because he was a European man, he was credited with doing it first. But the fact of the matter is that the idea of a means of production, the idea of people being forced to sell their labor to survive, the idea of the means of production being collected and controlled versus it, like controlled by a small number of people, all of these concepts that are core to understanding capitalism, core to understanding socialism, existed before Marx wrote them down. Before Marx wrote them down. So if you understand that, you can give Marx his credit, but you also have to understand that those forces existed before he, he observed them, before he documented them, which means he does not own those concepts. The masses of people, humanity owns those concepts. Even before Marx theorized this idea of a communist society and the idea of a capitalist society and like what ca how capitalism was built and how communism functioned, there were indigenous societies all throughout the world who organized their societies in a communistic way. And even like a scientific socialist or state socialist way. So attributing the entirety of socialism and communism, to, and capitalism, to be honest with you, to Marx or to Europe is giving them way too much credit and it's confusing the issue, to be quite honest with you. European people do not own these concepts that they so-called discovered. They no more discovered the concept of organizing society in a capitalist way, organizing society in a socialist way, than they discovered gravity or are they just so-called discovered the Americas or any other landmass. Like people always say, Columbus discovered America. Meanwhile, there are people already here. It's the same shit. So stop, stop. All credit to Marx for his observations, but that man did not invent any of this. All credit to Isaac Newton. I don't, I don't know about that. For writing it down, I guess. But that man did not discover gravity. Gravity was already here. These ways of organizing society were already here. All Marx did was write that shit down. My God. And the other thing about socialism being a white or Eurocentric ideology is that if you look at the societies 
that have actually succeeded in building socialism and fighting anti-colonial revolutions that built social societies. If you look at the people who actually did that, it's not Europeans. It's not Europeans. It's us. It's African people. It is Asian people. It is indigenous people. It's us. We have been the most sex successful in waging socialist revolutions on every continent. So if your socialism is supposed to be like a white or Eurocentric ideology, they are like pretty bad <laughs> at practicing that, man. For people that came up with it, they said can't, they can't really seem to pull it off yet. Like they're struggling, <laughs> like they're struggling. So yeah, I just completely reject the idea that socialism is in some way um, Eurocentric. And one thing that I notice quite often is that people will say that about socialism, but they very rarely say it about capitalism, which is very funny to me, because Europe is actually who spread capitalism across the world, but somehow socialism is the one that's Eurocentric. Okay, dog. Anyway, so yeah, is socialism a white ideology? Nope, no it's not. Marx does not own socialism any more than Isaac Newton owns gravity, period. Um, so Atiana Ray Fuentes, greetings comments, says, embarrassed to say I've never read anything by Kwame Ture. Where should I start? So, interesting fact about Kwame Ture is that he hasn't actually like written a lot of stuff. The, uh, the majority of his thought that you will find is in the form of those speeches that you can find really, really easy on YouTube. Like Kwame Ture was like not a huge writer. He wrote papers, he wrote some things, but he mostly wrote speeches. But in terms of understanding um, the life of Kwame Ture and like who he was and his politics, a book that I very highly recommend, which is actually ghostwritten, because like I said, he is not a writer, um, what is his biography, Ready for Revolution, The Life and Struggles of Kwame Ture. It is a extremely thick book. Let me see if I can get it. Get it off my shirt. <laughs> I have it. I have it ready to go. Yeah, it's a big book. It's very thick. But it's an extremely comprehensive history of his life from his own perspective, like in his words. So if you want to know about this man, if you want to know about the incredible amount of work he did to build, to fight for liberation for our people and to build Pan-Africanism, to build APRP, if you want to understand what he believed and why, then read his biography, Ready for Revolution. But also, like I said, search for him on YouTube and watch the videos of him speaking. Hear him for yourself. Like, man, I cannot watch a commentary speech without getting so hype. So hype. Actually, my favorite one, and you can find it on YouTube, um, is a debate about Zionism that he gave at a university in the United States. And he breaks down why Pan-Africanism is anti-Zionist in a very easy to understand way. He breaks down why Zionism is white supremacist and imperialist and genocidal towards, towards uh, Palestinians in a very easy to understand way. And at the end, this is my favorite part, it's like a Q&A with the audience and the audience is like really mad. <laughs> it's a bunch of Europeans and they're pissed. And they like, they just like go at him like one, one after the other. And he just like pings them off. Just like dismisses them. It's like so funny. Like it's so funny because he's like hitting them with facts and they're so angry. And he's just like so calm and just like cracking jokes. Oh my God. So yeah. Um, so search for commentary on YouTube. And my favorite speech personally is the Zionism debate. And then also lessons from the 60s. I think I mentioned earlier. Let me see, let me see. <laughs> yeah, it is a thick book. I agree. Um, and then Tito District on YouTube is also recommending Black Power, The Politics of Liberation, which was written by Kwame Ture and Charles Hamilton. Yeah, it's a really dope book as well. One really important thing to understand about that book is it was written as like Kwame Ture was like still developing his politics, right? So I talked about how he popularized the term Black Power, which is again coined by Mukasa Ricks. And so um, the uh, Black Power book was written at that particular point in his life before he became a revolutionary Pan-Africanist. So if you were to read Black Power and if you were to read like Ready to Revolution, you would see some very important political differences between the two Kwame Ture's. And it's a reflection of how his politics continued to develop as he turned towards Africa and understood Africa as primary for the liberation of African people around the world. And what's the name of the debate about Zionism? Let me find it. I'll drop the link in the, um, in the comments. And it'll also give me a chance to stop talking for a second. <laughs> Let me help, because I'm tired. Found it. So this is the Kwame Ture debate about Zionism. Check that video out. Make sure you watch the whole thing so you can see the audience, the Europeans in the audience getting all salty. Kwame Ture just like dunking on them. It's so good. That's so good. 
Anyway, <laughs> um, so I talked about what the means of production are. I talked about capitalism versus socialism. I talked about why socialism is the better way of organizing society, particularly for African people. I talked about socialism as a white ideology and why that's like nonsense. It's just nonsense. It's just point blank nonsense, y'all. It's nonsense. Nonsense. Um, and so last thing I really want to cover is socialism versus communism. Because sometimes I hear like confusion um, from people around this question, like what the difference between them is. Um, are they the same thing? Are they different things? Are they opposed? I saw like a tweet that people, it got like ratioed where people mostly like replied to it and were like, what the hell is wrong with you instead of like retweeting it. But where this European was basically like, uh, socialism is the exact opposite of communism. And people were like, what? <laughs> and I really feel like that's like a consequence of like the so-called like democratic socialists um, in the United States, like Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who are like openly hostile to socialist states like Cuba or Venezuela, but like look towards like Sweden. <laughs> or like the Netherlands or all these like imperialist European countries as like a model of socialism. So there's like a, been like a lot of confusion introduced about what socialism is. And like a lot of that confusion has like anti-communism at the root. And so now a lot of people think that socialism is somehow like completely separate from communism, even going so far as like this European on Twitter to say they're opposites. Now there's been confusion, confusion in imperialist countries under capitalism. So socialism versus communism. What is the socialism's relationship to communism? So socialism is easiest to understand as just a stage on the way to communism. Socialism is an economic system in which the means of production are collectively controlled by the masses of poor and working class people. Communism is a system where, again, those means of production are collectively controlled, but there's no state, there's no classes, the people have advanced to such a point where those things are just not needed anymore because they're able to, amongst themselves, organize the equitable distribution of resources and wealth. Socialism is literally just a transition stage between capitalism and communism. Because what's not possible, maybe like, I'll say it like this, it's never happened that a, a given nation or a given society has been able to go directly from capitalism to communism. They have never been able to go from an extremely stratified class-based society to a completely classless society with no transition phase. So socialism is that transition phase. So far from being like the opposite of communism or diametrically opposed to communism or just like a separate thing, no. Socialism is literally just the middle stage between capitalism and communism. That's it because we have understand, right? as revolutionaries, as people who are trying to transform society, that not only do we have to transform like the structure of society, the economic system, but we also have to transform the people within that society. We have to transform the ways that we relate to each other. We have to transform the ways that we relate to the earth. We have to transform every single part of this society, not just the economic system. So understanding the work that is before us in terms of actually making a revolution, there is no possible way that we could successfully just boop from this extremely oppressive, gen I say boop as like a transition word, <laughs> uh, from this like uh, structurally oppressive, genocidal, racist, patriarchal, sexist, ableist society to a, complete, like, a society where all of those contradictions are like magically resolved. Like it's just not gonna happen like that. We need this transition phase to transform not just the economic system, but the basic relations of society to life, to the planet and to each other. And socialism is that transition phase. So that's how you understand it. If it's like a timeline, right? And things are not like linear like this, okay? So like this is just like a very simple metaphor. But if it's like a timeline, right? It's like capitalism over here on the past side, middle socialism, communism at the end, right? Just imagine them as points on a line. Again, keeping in mind, as rarely that linear. Like for example, there's been like a lot of um, concessions made to capitalism within socialist societies that are like struggling to survive like Cuba, thanks to the blockade, had to allow private investment and private businesses. And that's like kind of like a regression towards capitalism. Because that's like the reality situation. You can be like a social society, but if you're completely surrounded by a capitalist system and you're being actively attacked, there's gonna be some concessions for you to you be able to make it, right? On like a day-to-day -day basis. So yeah. Um so let me see, let me see. What are y'all saying? Um Tito says, Thank you for the link, you're welcome. Uh Louise says United Snakes. 
Yes, that's what we call it. United Snakes of America. The APIP has all kinds of pejoratives to insult the U.S. Empire because we reject any identity of American and we also we reject the legitimacy of the United States of America. This place is built on stolen land with stolen labor through genocide and mass theft. Man does not deserve to exist. And so we say United Snakes is a way of saying, fuck you, USA. We hate you. Um, Zizwe says, Karl Marx learned from an African professor named Willie Amu at the University of Berlin about society, economics, etc. And another person who was theorizing about how society was organized, um, how, <laughs> how economies were organized long before Karl Marx was a man known as Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun was an Ethiopian philosopher who was alive in like the 1300s, hundreds of years before Marx, who observed basic things about the fundamental nature of capitalist and feudal society that Marx himself saw hundreds of years before Marx did. So like I said, socialism, communism, these are concepts that belong to the masses of people. They are not concepts that belong to Europe. Socialism could not be a Eurocentric or white ideology because European and white people did not invent socialism. It belongs to all of us, not to them. It's a science, it belongs to humanity, period. That's it, it's not white. Oh yeah, Kareem also recommends for people who are looking to see um, more videos of Kwame Ture. He has a really good debate about Pan-Africanism versus Afrocentrism with Molefi, Molefi Asante, which you can also find on YouTube. It's really good. He lays out the history of Pan-Africanism. He lays out why Pan-Africanism is scientific socialist. It's just a very good debate. Um, Zizwe says, the Scandinavian states are welfare states. They are also part of imperialism by participating in NATO. Correct. That is not why, that's why they're not actually socialists. Those are still capitalist nations. They just happen to have strong welfare states. And the reason why they have strong welfare states is because they benefit materially from the exploitation of Africa and the global south. Scandinavian nations, Norway, uh, Sweden, the Netherlands, they are still part of the imperialist system that is exploiting Africa and African nations and African people and indigenous nations and indigenous people. They are still part of that same system that puts the white world on top of the rest of us. Still part of it, still benefit it. That's why they got to have such good healthcare benefits. Um, even though those, those benefits are being eroded, even in those countries, because capitalism will not take care of you for long. Capitalism is about hoarding wealth for a handful of people and fuck everybody else. Um, Betty is asking, is this going to be available to watch later? Yes, Betty. So you can watch these videos after the show is over on our YouTube channel, APPR, All African People's Revolutionary Party in New Mexico um, on YouTube. And you can also watch it on our Facebook um, after the show as well. These are always available after, oops, that's not what I want to put there. I want to put our YouTube channel. Um, after, after the show airs. It's like very hard to write and talk at the same time. So that is what socialism is. I hope this conversation was helpful for you. We say that our objective is one unified socialist Africa because we understand that Africa will never be liberated under capitalism. The first form of capital on earth, guess what it was? Guess. What was the first form of capital on earth? What was it? I'm trying to see if y'all answer. <laughs> it was African people. It was my ancestors. The first form of capital on this planet was enslaved African people. Capitalism became a global economic system thanks to the enslavement of African people, the theft of indigenous land, and the colonization of Africa. That is why we are all living under capitalism today. That is what made it possible for it to spread across the world. The enslavement of African people, the theft of indigenous land, and the colonization of Africa. So understanding the beginnings of capitalism that literally started with buying and selling my ancestors and stealing my land, how the hell would I, as a person, an African person, an African woman, find liberation through a system like that? It like makes no sense on its face. But P. Diddy, T.I., Ice Cube, they want you to believe that liberation for us means more money for them. Get out of my face. Get out of my face, get out of my face. Anyway, so capitalism is death. Capitalism is death for African people. Exploitation of African resources, theft in, of indigenous land, and genocide against indigenous nations. Capitalism is literally, literally putting us on a trajectory where most of the life on the planet will be extinguished 
within a hundred years. That is the trajectory that capitalism has put us on, and it has no solution. These Europe, these billionaires, this ruling class is looking to space because they have no plan to stop climate change that's going to destroy people's lives on this planet. They're like, what about Mars? Because they don't give a fuck. They don't give a fuck. They will poison the water. They will destroy the land. They will drill until all the resources are depleted. And then they will go to space and do it there while we suffer and die with no water and food. That is what they are planning. That is the trajectory of capitalism. Socialism is life. Socialism is an actual future where it's not just like mass suffering till we all die. That is the choice. Either a few people make it or we all make it. Those are the options. Capitalism versus socialism. Anyway, so that was the P section of the show. I feel like it takes so long when I'm by myself. But if like Demetrius here and Monique is here, it's like very like boom, boom, boom. Because I'd be like ranting, man, like on these tangents. But I hope that y'all got something out of that. Again, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, drop them in the chat. I can see them. I'll respond to them. Oh, yeah. So Macy's saying uh, with a commentary quote, Capitalism doesn't lie some of the time. It lies all the time. Even when it tells the truth, it's the result of a double lie. I love that quote. I love that quote, and it's actually a very good transition to the next part of the show where I want to talk about what is going on with this pandemic. What is going on with this pandemic? Ladies and gentlemen, siblings, family, we are entering the worst part of this. Like, we have been in, like, this haphazard lockdown, this you know, mask wearing, this like social distancing, all of these practices since like March or April. Folks have been doing this with different levels of commitment. But the fact of the matter is that we are not even close to through with this pandemic. And in fact, as we are heading into the cold season around the United States, as we are entering into the holiday season, we are actually about to hit what will probably be by far the worst part of this pandemic. Um, in the United States, we have passed 200,000 deaths. Of those deaths, we see that African and indigenous people are disproportionately represented. We are getting hit the hardest and we are dying the most. We have seen in the United States that the election happened this past week. It looked like Biden won for a while, but who knows how that's gonna go. I'm not even gonna get into it because I don't wanna make y'all upset, but woo, I don't even know, man. But for now, it looks like Biden won, right? And so a lot of people are saying, like, thank goodness, Biden's going to handle this pandemic a lot better than Trump, right? And so I guess I lied when I said I'm not going to upset y'all because that's bullshit. Like, it's not true that Biden's going to handle the pandemic better than Trump. The difference between Biden and Trump on COVID-19 is that Trump just, like, overtly downplays it, right? Because Trump has his primary motivation as the continuing of this process of the wealthy few extracting wealth from the rest of us. So he is mostly focused on getting back to business. But truth be told, Biden is too. If you look at Biden's COVID plan, if you look at what this man is actually offering, there is no reason whatsoever to believe that he will handle this pandemic any differently in Trump. The main difference is how they talk about it. Trump downplays it and Biden says, this is very serious. But Biden is against universal health care. The man is against universal health care during a global pandemic. He has said that Medicare for all, whatever you want to call it, a system where every single person has access to health care is not on the table. Point blank. And so explain to me the difference between a president who downplays COVID-19 and says, you still got to go to work. And also, if you're poor and you get sick, there's no health care for you, fuck off. And a president who says, this is very serious, and also, you still have to go to work, and if you're poor, you don't get health care, fuck off. Explain to me the difference. Beyond that, if you actually look at what's promised in Biden's platform, he says things like, we're going to double the number of drive through testing sites, um, you know, around the nation. He doesn't give an exact number, he says we're going to double it. But here in Tiwa territory, we have like fucking six, six drive through testing centers. So he doubles it and we have 12. In a city of hundreds of thousands, like, come on, y'all. And then also, he doesn't even say anything about helping people who don't have health insurance access those tests. You're supposed to have free testing here in Tiwa Territory, but I know for a fact that I got charged $500 in my health insurance to take that test. And if I hadn't had health insurance, I would've got a bill in the mail for hundreds of dollars, just like my comrade. 
So if people do not have access to healthcare, what difference does it make if the president acknowledges the pandemic is a real thing or downplays it? Like, what is the practical difference for the people living day to day? If he's saying that we're going to double testing centers, but he's not, doesn't have any plan whatsoever for improving access to testing, then what is the practical difference? If he's telling you, make sure you wear a mask, make sure you social distance, make sure you wash your hands, but he's not saying a single thing about rent freezes or making sure that people are not forced to keep going to work during a pandemic with the public. If he's not saying anything about giving people health care, then explain to me how Biden is going to deal with this in a better way than Trump. I pretty much, I don't understand why people think that if the Democrats had been in power when this pandemic hit, that fewer people would have died. Because the fact of the matter is that there are millions of people who are extremely vulnerable to this pandemic who do not have access to health care. And the Democrats have definitively said that they have no intention of addressing that. So even if Hillary Clinton, that, let me just not be misogynistic actually, even if Hillary Clinton, that very terrible person, had beaten Donald Trump in 2016, Explain to me what it would have been different if Hillary Clinton is still against universal health care. Explain to me how people, less people would have died if the majority of people who do not have access to consistent health care in the society are African indigenous people. Explain to me how fewer of those people would have died. Explain that to me. Explain it to me. Y'all will take the most symbolic victories. You will take a racist, imperialist, warmongering, warmongering neoliberal saying nice things to you as an actual victory, as that person is saying, you will not be getting healthcare during a pandemic. Y'all are a, let me stop. Let me not attack y'all. It's a joke. The situation is a joke to me. Anyway, and then as my comrade Erica from Hood Communist and Black Alliance for Peace, Nojima People's Party is pointing out in the comments, Joe Biden has put a straight up eugenicist on his coronavirus task force a straight up eugenicist. It's Rahm Emanuel's brother. The man's name is Ezekiel Emanuel. He is a um, professor at a school in Philadelphia um, in charge of health policy and medical ethics, a department which is very funny to me. And the reason why I'm calling him a eugenicist is because aside from being on this task force, Ezekiel Emanuel is most famous for writing an op-ed in The Atlantic where he argues that there's no reason for people to live past 75. The man that Joe Biden appointed to his coronavirus task force that is supposed to be developing a strategy to make this pandemic less devastating for vulnerable people in the United States wrote an op-ed published in The Atlantic where he argues that life is not worth living past 75. That people no longer make valuable contributions past 75. The title of the article is Why I Wish I Die at 75. Appointed to the Coronavirus Task Force by presumed president-elect Joe Biden. I don't know why y'all think it's gonna be better under this motherfucking neoliberal this warmonger, this racist, this imperialist, this sexual assaulter, but you are lying to yourselves and I cannot lie to you because I love you. So yeah, and as Tito points out on YouTube, Michael Bloomberg, who for a brief moment was a hero of the resistance, billionaire Michael Bloomberg, uh, also made similar statements about elderly people <laughs> no longer being useful contributing members of society. Meanwhile, I'm in a revolutionary African organization that has members from age like eight to age like 80 and beyond. So someone tells me no one can make valuable contributions past the age of 75, and I think about all the elders that made me the revolution I am today, without whom I would be as confused as y'all. Anyway, sorry, there's just like, it's just like offensive, right? Cause like African culture venerates elders. African culture protects and uplifts elders. European culture, capitalist culture says, you are no longer making me money, so you should just die after 75. And that is the person, once again, that Joe Biden has put on the coronavirus task force. Good luck to y'all. Good luck with that push left. Anyway, so Joe Biden, Donald Trump, 
In terms of handling this pandemic, either way, thousands of people, mostly African, indigenous people, and apparently elders, are going to motherfucking die. Joe Biden is going to focus on uplifting individual actions. Actions that you, as one person within the society, should take to address this pandemic. He's going to say wear a mask. He's going to say social distance. He's going to say wash your hands. He's going to say stay home. But the fact of the matter is that individual actions can only do so much. They can only do so much in a global pandemic, in a situation where if people, the more people go out, the more people are forced to continue to work so they can pay their rent because their rent is being frozen, the more at risk they are. So individual actions can only do so much in such a situation. If people are not given any kind of safety net, they're going to keep working so they don't get evicted, so they can keep eating, so they can take care of their kids. Period. So what needs to happen needs to go beyond individual actions. Wearing a mask only does so much. Only some people can stay home. What needs to happen is precisely what happened in Venezuela. Precisely what happened in Cuba. Precisely what happened in Vietnam, which are, by the way, all societies that fought revolutions and attempted to build socialism. That's what they all have in common. And in Venezuela, and in Cuba, and in Vietnam, they paid people to stay home. They froze the rent. Vietnam delivered good food door to door. They have free universal health care. They are making sure that if they are asking people to stay home, that those people are actually able to do so. That's the only way this pandemic is going to get under control in the United States, if that's even possible anymore. The only way, the only way that thousands and thousands of people, mostly African and indigenous and Chicano and Filipino people are gonna die, are not gonna die, is if we pay people to stay home. If we freeze the rent, don't tell me to stay home, but then keep charging me rent, and then tell me I can't go to, that makes no sense, man. That makes no sense. Pay people to stay home. Freeze the rent. Freeze the bills. Give them health care. Feed them. That's it. Meet people's basic needs. Make it possible for them to quarantine during this pandemic. Otherwise, it will not be controlled and more people will die. Mostly my people. Mostly indigenous people. Mostly colonized people. Joe Biden is not offering that. Donald Trump is not offering that. These ruling class parties are not offering that. They are going to let you die and they are going to keep saying wear a mask, social distance, wash your hands, and deny you health care. So all what needs to happen to get this pandemic under control is that people's material needs must be provided for. And we already know this system, this capitalist system, these ruling class parties are not going to do that, which means the masses of poor and working class and colonized people must organize to build our power and take, take what we need to survive. Because COVID-19, best believe, is not the last global, uh, uh, global pandemic that's going to hit us like this. Far from it. If you've been paying attention, these global pandemics are increasing in frequency because they are a direct consequence of the capitalist means of organizing society in which life and land are destroyed, in which forests are cut down, in which you know life that had not previously not been exposed to humans is suddenly being exposed to humans and exposing us to pathogens that we do not have any immunity for, in which meat, meat is produced under such vile and barbaric conditions that new viruses are being introduced into the world. And so it is capitalism fundamentally that was the cause of the COVID-19 pandemic. Fucking Trump's pointing at China, all these people pointing fingers, people calling it conspiracy, people blaming 5G. No, sis! It was capitalism, and it's not going to stop. This is not the last pandemic. It's going to keep happening. It's going to get worse, and there's no plan. There's no plan. There's no plan to stop the destruction of the planet. There's no plan to make food production less barbaric, and there's no plan to provide you with health care to be able to survive this shit. So understand, it is socialism or it is death from catastrophic climate change and global pandemics that are going to get worse and worse and worse. Do not think that motherfucking handsy segregationist is going to save you from this. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. All you need to know about Joe Biden and COVID-19 is that Joe Biden is against universal health care. That's what you need to know. Anyway. Um, yeah. Tito says the Atlantic is supposed to be a progressive population. Man, that is the truth. All like the 
the media, the media sources that are supposed to be like on the left side, like MSNBC, the progressive. Some of people call the New York Times liberal. No, they're just like the fucking left wing of imperialism, if that's what you mean by left. The left wing in capitalism, the left wing of the ruling class. They still lie. They're still racist. They're still pro empire. They're still like imperialist as hell. All those publications. So yeah, the idea that the Atlantic should be progressive and they published that article about how people should die at 75 is a very clear illustration of the fundamental contradiction of calling things progressive when they are pro-capitalist and pro-imperialist. Um, Tito says, Denmark, Spain, and the Netherlands have had to slaughter their Ming populations because another COVID strain is coming from that industry. No stigmatization of those countries, though. I read about that, too. I read about that, too. I'm killing off all the minks. Because that's, it's not China, man. It's capitalism. <laughs> that's what, ha- that is how COVID knocked us all on our ass. It was not China. It was capitalism. And it's not the last time this is going to happen. So that was COVID updates. I'm going to wrap it up now because I am tired of talking, to be honest with you. I appreciate y'all. I love all y'all. We are very grateful for your eyes on the show. We are grateful to everybody that comments, grateful to everybody shares the stream. So I want to say that I'm tired of talking to you. I'm just tired of talking. I'm actually like an introverted person. Okay, so in closing, next week on the show, we have been doing a series of 101 type conversations where we explain concepts that are fundamental to our conception of revolution. We talked about what is revolutionary solidarity. We talked about what is a bourgeois election. So we're doing this like 101 series. And so next week that continues. And we're going to be talking about what is colonialism? What is colonialism? You hear me say colonized people? You hear me say Africa is colonized? You hear me talk about neocolonialism and colonialism? So next week we're going to go into detail about what colonialism actually is, the different types of colonialism, the consequences of colonialism in the, in the present day. And also what we, as colonized people, can do to destroy that shit, point blank period. Also, this coming Saturday, All African People's Revolutionary Party New Mexico prevents the Nove- presents the November edition of our Pan-African Film Series. We do the film series every second Saturday of the month, every single month. We have done it for two years straight without missing a single time. I'm so proud. I'm so proud. We didn't even miss a beat when the pandemic hit. But this coming Saturday is the second Saturday of November. And so we will be showing at 2 p.m. Mountain Time a double feature. A double feature where we'll be talking about African and Indigenous solidarity. First up is What's in the Name, which is a panel discussion featuring Kwame Ture and a number of other African organizers in a debate about what African people in the United States should call ourselves. What should African people in the United States call ourselves? It's very clear what I believe, what the APRP believes, that we are Africans, period. But this panel discussion will feature a number of perspectives. People arguing black, people arguing African American, people arguing just American, because they're deeply confused. But if you want to hear all these perspectives alongside the APRP perspective that we are Africans, period, tune in for that Saturday at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. And then the next film we're showing is a interview with Nick Estes of the Red Nation, talking about his book, Our History is the Future, talking about the concept of indigenous communism, because again, communism is not a white ideology. Communism is not a Eurocentric ideology. Communism belongs to the masses of people on earth, African indigenous people just the same. So Nick Estes talking about his book, Our History is the Future, talking about indigenous, indigenous communism and indigenous revolutionary nationalism. So tune in this coming Saturday at 2 p.m. Mountain Time for those films and then a facilitated discussion hosted by some members of APP New Mexico. And then also, as I mentioned, this coming Sunday the 15th is the anniversary of Kwame Ture's transition from the earth. He is now an ancestor, unfortunately. I wish I could have met him. Sometimes it makes me really sad. But we want to celebrate him on that day, Kwame Ture Day, November 15th. And so please tune in to APIP California comrade Ajamu and his daughter Shikora's weekly program where they will be doing a tribute to Kwame Ture. That is, again, this coming Sunday the 15th at 4 p.m. Pacific time or 5 p.m. Mountain time. I want to again thank you all so much for tuning in every week. Thank you for sharing the stream. Thank you for your comments. I want to end by saying that if you are watching me, if you can hear my voice and you're not active in a revolutionary organization fighting for the people, then join an organization. Join an organization fighting for justice and help us destroy capitalism and build something better in its place. Thank you so much. Stay ready for a revolution. Have a great rest of your day.